History of the Hungarian People's Republic. The 1947 Elections These days, anti-communists often claim that there was some kind of election fraud, just like they claimed about the 1945 elections. However, there is once again absolutely no proof of this. On the contrary, quote, such newspaper correspondents, however, as those representing Le Monde in Paris and the Times and Herald Tribune in New York, reported that, in general, so far as they could see, there was neither violence nor abuse, and that elections went off rather quietly and fairly. The general verdict, even of anti-left observers, was that, on the whole, the election was quiet, free, and bona fide." Unquote. Now, this is going to sound absolutely ridiculous when I spell it out, but the so-called strongest proof of election fraud is that people who were working, or for any reason, away from their home district, were still given the opportunity to vote. Now, what does this mean in actual practice? Anti-communists have invented this myth that communists gave out a lot of these voting slips to people who then supposedly voted in many different places at the same time. That is, they would have voted several times. However, there is actually no good proof of this. This is mostly based on rumors and stories of supposed eyewitnesses. So if right-wing reactionaries went to vote, and then they saw strangers who weren't from there also voting, they would claim, oh, those guys are just communists who have been sent here, and they've probably voted many times already. But how could they know that they have voted many times? Of course they couldn't know that. These right-wing conservatives simply saw strangers that they didn't know, and being generally hostile to outsiders, especially if they were from the cities or if they were leftists, then they immediately invented these lies. Now, of course, it's a nice story. It's an interesting story. The communists are arriving from outside, and they're coming here to vote. Because nobody in this town would vote for the communists. Everybody who votes for the communists must be some guy who was sent from the outside. It's an interesting story, but it's only a story, and it cannot be verified in any way. Anti-communists further claim that the communists believed that they would get an absolute majority, that is, more than 50% of all votes, through this kind of fraud. But that sounds completely unbelievable and anti-communist historians have actually never even agreed how many extra votes this supposedly should have gotten the communists. Why don't they agree? Well, they don't agree because there's no actual proof for this. There's no actual source. It's just a rumor. So it's naturally impossible to accurately calculate. Usually they suggest that it could be tens of thousands of votes. Some of them even say a hundred thousand votes which might sound like a lot, but considering that the communists actually got more than a million votes, it really has no significance. If more than five million people vote, then how exactly could tens of thousands of fake votes, or even a hundred thousand fake votes, heck, even a million fake votes, how could that supposedly get an absolute majority? It absolutely could not. It's absolutely ridiculous. The story makes no sense. Naturally, no documents about rigging of elections have ever been found, despite the communist archives being available and open to right-wing researchers today. This myth about the 1947 elections has become very famous these days, but back in the day, at the time when it was supposedly happening, people actually didn't care about it, they didn't talk about it, it wasn't really a thing, because it wasn't real. Instead, back then, people had completely different arguments for why they claimed that the election was somehow rigged. So imagine that. So they always claimed that it was rigged, because it has to be. No matter what, they always have to claim that the communists have rigged the elections. But it's blatantly obvious that this is not true, because originally the argument how it was rigged was completely different. If it was actually rigged, then you would imagine that the story would stay consistent all the time. They would say, oh look, they rigged it that way, and that's how it was rigged, and they would consistently say that. 
but that's not actually what happened. Instead, they had a completely different way of claiming it was rigged originally, and then later, they invented a new way of how it was supposedly rigged. So, before they invented this other story about fake votes, what did they originally say? Well, originally they said that the election was rigged because Nazis were not allowed to vote. I'm dead serious. However, it should be kept in mind that in most countries immediately after World War II, Nazis were not allowed to vote. Hungary wasn't in any way different in this. The clerical fascist Cardinal Minzenti complained that fascists were not allowed to vote. However, while in 1945, there were 5,100,000 people who voted, in 1947, the number of voters had not decreased, but it had increased to 5,400,000. So there were more people voting, and not less. So clearly this is not a case of voting rights being taken away from more and more people. In fact, quite the opposite. American journalist Howard K. Smith wrote that, quote, Only some 300,000 Hungarians were disqualified from voting on suspicion of having had Nazi affiliations. The proportion of disqualifications of Nazis was the same as in the elections of democratic Belgium, where there were certainly far fewer Nazis than in Hungary, unquote. But somehow the elections in Belgium were considered completely fine, while in Hungary, all the reactionaries cry about the vote supposedly being rigged. After the ousting of the reactionaries, the smallholders party was being taken over by the left wing. A core of the most right-wing deputies left the party to create a new, even more right-wing party. Quote, Zoltan Pfeiffer led another 50 deputies from the smallholders, this time as the Independence Party. Unquote. Quote, the right-wing forces organized new parties in order to campaign in the elections. Under the leadership of Zoltan Pfeiffer, a lawyer ousted from the smallholders party, a party was formed which subscribed to the ignominious cause of neo-fascism. Istvan Barankovic, a conservative politician, organized a clerical party, and there was a party headed by Margit Schlachta, which received support from various orders of nuns. Father Istvan Balog, a former leader of the Smallholders Party, also organized a new party. In addition, the Bourgeois Democratic Party and the Radical Party contested in the elections, as they had in 1945. Unquote. All these new reactionary parties ran in the 1947 elections against the Popular Front Coalition. The Communists emerged as the largest party, with 22%. The Social Democrats lost some of their votes, and now had 14%. Since the reactionaries of various types had now left the smallholders, their support was reduced to 15%, and the National Peasant Party increased its support to 8%. The biggest right-wing parties were the Barankovic clericals with 16%, and Pfeiffer's neo-fascist nationalists with 13%. Communists won 22% of the votes. Quote, Making a common list with the parties of the left, they could claim a majority. Unquote. At this point, it's worth noting that the smallholders party, of course, had a left wing, which eventually became more and more powerful, and that even the smallholder party had accepted the communist proposal for a three-year economic plan of reconstruction and nationalization of the biggest banks and state control of key sectors of the economy. The Social Democrats and the National Peasants also supported this, together with other communist demands such as purging of fascists and punishment of war criminals. So, although the Communist Party still did not get an absolute majority of votes, even though they were the biggest individual party, the other parties of the coalition had moved significantly to the left and had accepted the main points of the communist program. Of course, it would have been somewhat unrealistic to imagine that all Hungarians would become communists in only two years, but it is evident that they still supported socialism in all practical questions, because the program of the Popular Front was actually a socialist program in essence, regardless of which party in the coalition 
someone might most identify with. Athaker writes, quote, The total voting for the two parties standing for socialism, that is, communists and social democrats, came to about 38% of the entire electorate. In addition, many of the planks of the other parties included more or less complete adherence to socialism. It seems reasonably clear that, by 1947, a majority of the Hungarian electorate was voting in favor of socialism, of varying modes and degrees." Unquote. Quote, the entire coalition polled 61 percent. Some anti-communists have claimed, as usual, that communists used some type of election fraud. However, no evidence of this has ever been produced. And besides, the communists gained a moderate increase from 17% to 22%. Meanwhile, social democrats lost 3% and the smallholders lost much more. Is it not more logical that the communists simply attracted some new voters from these parties due to their achievements? I'll give some examples. The anti-communist historian Paul E. Zinner writes, quote, Communist mayor of Budapest won respect for the dramatic and efficient supply of the capital with food in the fall of 1945, when famine threatened. The communist minister of transportation, Erno Gero, won plaudits as the chief architect of the rapid rebuilding of the Danube bridges in Budapest and elsewhere. A popular slogan in Hungary at the time was, Long live Gero, the bridge builder. Finally, the communists received credit for stabilizing the Hungarian currency in the summer of 1946, after a runaway inflation. The communists made a favorable impression by both their agricultural and their industrial policies. Between 1945 and 1947, all major social groups benefited from the economic upsurge. The workers scored impressive social gains. The middle class was able to recover losses dating back to the closing phases of the war. But the most striking social and economic advances were made by the peasantry. Communist economic policies contributed significantly to maintaining quote-unquote alliances with the peasantry and the middle class. Unquote. Special correspondent in Southern Europe for the nation, Hilde Spiel, wrote from Budapest, quote, the wildest inflation in history has ravaged Hungary during these last few weeks. Unquote. She writes that the feudal landlords and a number of large financiers left in Hungary, besides a large and bloated bureaucracy, are hindering the government effort to stop the inflation. She writes further, quote, The only danger to the country seems to lie with those citizens who are determined at all costs to prevent economic stabilization. They are to be found among the few remaining big financiers and industrialists, the disgruntled state officials and the landed gentry deprived of their property. Aided by their social standing and their undeniable charm, they try to influence members of the Western Allied missions against the government, hoping to obstruct the financial reconstruction and thus unseat the present regime. Unquote. Despite this obstruction by reactionaries, the communists had succeeded in stopping the inflation, as I mentioned in episode 2. The anti-communist historian Apor, in his book about propaganda, writes that, quote, The communists' call for the country's reconstruction fell on fertile ground. Their slogans advocating equality, land reform and the punishment of war criminals had a significant appeal whereas their attempt to include formerly disenfranchised social groups in political affairs brought them a genuine popularity. Unquote. Historian Molnar writes, quote, The reconstruction plan launched by the communists and supported by the other parties was an undisputed success. Unquote. Count Karoy writes in his memoirs that, quote, Erno Gere, Minister of Public Works and Reconstruction was the hardest worker at his office, always the first in the morning and the last at night, unquote. And he further says about the communists that, quote, their competence, energy, and at times a wise sense of diplomacy were recognized by everyone, 
the bourgeois parties were of little consequence, having no definite program and no leading personalities. Unquote. And highly anti-communist historian Pünkösti writes that, quote, according to opinion polls in 1947, especially in the countryside, the leader of the communists, Rakoshi, was by far the most esteemed Hungarian politician, and he was considered the most suitable for the post of prime minister, unquote. And this is not something that Pünkösti has invented, because Apor, who is also a huge anti-communist, says pretty much the same thing. He says, quote, Rakoshi enjoyed remarkable popularity among the Hungarian population in the post-war years, especially among the petty bourgeoisie, the intelligentsia, and the industrial workers of Budapest. In January 1946, he was the country's second most popular politician, and he rose to first place a year later. He was considered the most skillful leftist orator in May 1948, and an August 1947 poll showed that the majority of respondents regarded him as the person best qualified to be prime minister. Rakoshi's popularity is normally attributed to his and the Communist Party's role in reconstruction after the war. The party's popularity was partly reflected in the sudden growth of its membership after the war. Many of the newcomers joined the party because of the role it played in reconstruction. Land distribution, the introduction of the new currency, and price reductions for basic commodities were popular measures. Rakoshi's relative popularity seems genuine enough. Unquote. But no, even after such achievements, if the communists manage to grow their support even by 5%, anti-communists will immediately accuse them of election fraud. The results of the 1947 election were somewhat similar to the 1945 elections. The government still needed to be a coalition, but as a coalition it had a comfortable majority. The most noticeable change was the split between the left and the right. The amorphous big tent smallholders had split, and half of them were now in opposition to the government. While the left had become more united, the right wing was becoming more disunited. They worked together, but were clearly divided into two different groups. Pfeiffer's nationalists, who were more urban, and Barankovich's Catholics, who were rural. The Catholic Church also got into conflict with the Barankovich party because it wasn't considered conservative enough. Quote, Signs of disintegration began to appear in the Barankovich party. Although this party had won the vast majority of the Catholic vote, it was unable to come to an agreement with extremely conservative Cardinal Minzenti. Hungary's Archbishop Primate. Because of the conflicts between the church leadership and the leadership of the Barankovitz party, the clergy withdrew their support from the party. After this, the organization of the Barankovitz party, most of which had been set up during the election campaign, rapidly fell apart. The party leadership too was affected by these developments. Many left the party altogether. The collapse of this party was precipitated by the fact that Joseph Minzenti, head of the Catholic Church, was dissatisfied with the party's activity. Minzenti stubbornly insisted on the restoration of the Habsburg dynasty, which he expected to result from a Third World War and from an American military victory in that war. Thus, the Barankovitz party came under attack from both right and left. Realizing that this situation was hopeless, Istvan Barankovitz left the country and his supporters in Hungary announced the dissolution of the party." Unquote. 